Welcome to Elijah's Prophetic Cup and the Fivefold Ministry. Join us as we discuss the five Torah scrolls along with topics that include the gifts of the Spirit and the School of the Prophets. Now my wife and your host, Tekoa Man. Hi, it's Tekoa Manning here with Elijah's Prophetic Cup. And I'm going to be talking today about predictions and prophecy. If a prediction comes true, then it succeeded. But if a prophecy comes true, it failed. So I want you to think Jonah. I want you to think Hezekiah because Jonah's prophetic utterance that Nineveh was going to be destroyed did not come forth. And so we realized that if that prophecy had come to pass, it would have been a failure because a lot of people would have been destroyed and a lot of animals. And instead, there was this great repentance I also want you to think about Hezekiah, and I'm going to read just a little bit about this story. It says, in those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. The prophet Isaiah, he came to him and he said, this is what the Lord Adonai says. He says, put your house in order for you about to die. You will not recover. So we know that this um, this was a warning from the prophet and it did not come forth because then it says, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord Adonai saying, please remember how I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion, I have done what was good in your sight. And then Hezekiah began to weep bitterly. And so before Isaiah had left the courtyard, it says the word of Adonai came to him and said, go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, that this is what the Lord, the God of your father, David says, I've heard your prayers. I've seen your tears. I will surely heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the house of the Lord Adonai, and I will add 15 years to your life. And so I wanted to go back after, you know, you've processed that a little bit and repeat this. There is a big difference between prediction and prophecy. If a prophecy comes true, it has failed. If a prediction comes true, it has succeeded. Now, there's several ways that we can tell the difference in a type of prophetic um, gifting that leans toward divination and this Greek type thought of prediction. And what happens is a lot of people get swept up in that and people have lost their jobs. They've lost their homes. They've sold everything because someone predicted that the Messiah was going to come back. And it's been just a few years ago. And one day I was at the store and this man parked next to me and he had detailed his van and airbrushed the whole side with the warning that Messiah was coming back on this particular day at this time in this year. And I often wondered what he ended up painting over that or what might have happened. But we need to, to be aware of this and we need to make sure that we're not getting caught up in false prophets or false predictions because with the things going on in the world and us coming 
upon the election here in America. There's already been a lot of chaos. There's already been many people. You can you can go to YouTube and type in uh, dream about Trump, uh, dream about what's going to happen in November, vision of Biden. I mean, you name it, things will pop up. And a lot of people can get caught up in that type of thing and they're just watching these all day and then they're just living in fear and 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 so we have the ability like hezekiah to to weep bitterly and to ask for the father's mercy and his grace and for him to forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings and to protect us and to protect our families. Even if right outside our door there is chaos, he says he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will be a ring of fire around about us. And we can have the attitude of David when he was running from Saul and hiding in the cleft of the rock and hiding and, and tucking himself up under Adonai's wing and the father was faithful to speak to him. And so I wanted to switch gears a little bit here because I know many people out there who are battling with the office of the prophet, they're wondering if they do have this uh, assignment or mantle. And there's a lot of fear and also skepticism and also it's very difficult for a person who does hold this office to come out and actually speak about it but the good news is you if you hold this office and you've gotten confirmation then you know that you don't have to tell anyone that you're a prophet because the body of Yeshua Messiah will tell you that you are a prophet and there is no need to even worry about that sort of thing. But I wanted to talk about how at certain times prophets know things. And we also know that on the day of Pentecost called Shavuot in the Hebrew and Acts 2 that the Holy Spirit or the Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew fell on the people and, and we read from the Apostle Paul or Shaul in 1 Corinthians, in Corinthians 12 and 13, all about these spiritual gifts and how the Holy Spirit will often use and work through a person with these prophetic gifts because everyone in the body is given dreams from the Father at times. Everyone in the body may have a vision here and there. And sometimes they may hear something in their spiritual ear or see something that the Father says, hey, take a look at that again. And so there are many prophetic giftings in, and they can be in anyone's toolbox at any given time, but the prophet who holds that office of the prophet is walking in this and often uh, many times weekly or sometimes for several days at a time, they may, they may be seeing things, hearing things, and knowing things, and for the young prophet in training, I want to just open that up a little bit and then give you some tips at the end. But I'm going to read from 1 Samuel 9. I'm going to start at verse 15. It says, Now on the day before Saul's arrival, Adonai had revealed to Samuel, At this time tomorrow I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. And you are to anoint him leader over my people Israel. He will save them from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. 
When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of who I spoke. He will rule over my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? Remember, back then, the prophet or Nabi was called a seer. Verse 19, I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. And when I send you off in the morning, I will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them, for they have been found. And upon whom is all the desire of Israel, if not upon you and all your father's house? So Samuel is sitting in his place there. He is meditating. He is praying unto Adonai. And Adonai is speaking to him. I'm sending a man. You're going to recognize him. I will let you know when he gets there that this is the one that I want you to anoint for he is going to be king over my people. And he even says to Samuel, hey, uh, this guy saw his father's donkeys got loose. He's been searching for them. And so uh, this is the whole reason that Saul ends up going to the seer. He doesn't know that he's getting ready to be anointed and become the king. He is looking for his father's donkeys, which would have been a lot of worth, especially back then. And so Samuel says, um, as for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them for they have been found. He knows that this has already happened. He's actually hearing things in his ear and then he's watching them come forth. And many times in my own life, in my own experiences, the father will tell me something. I will hear something. I will see something that he says, look at that again, Bonnie, or he will give me a passage in the Bible and it will be a personal word for me and he will give me a dream or there will be a vision or something and portions of that will begin to manifest in the natural first. And so I'm not sure if you understand what I'm trying to say but I'm going to give you an example. I was hesitant to go visit and spend time with a certain person because there had been a lot of conflict and dis-ease and I was praying about it and I'm driving down the road and all of a sudden there's construction site and a sign that said, do not block. <clears throat> and then it had this person's name, intersection. And the street sign, the name of the street was also this person's name. And when I looked up, the father said, read that, look at that, don't block this. This is the open door. I want you to see this person and it's going to be okay. Or he'll warn me uh, that there is a storm coming or the enemy is trying to get inside of my house. Uh, through an adversary and maybe in the dream my my door will be open and they're trying to come in and then the next day there's a bad storm that literally just blows my door wide open and when I go to shut it he'll remind me shut the door turn your boat don't let the adversary in your home these are small little examples and I want to move on because I don't want to go too long. So I want to go to 2 Kings 6. And I wanted to share with you guys a prophetic word the Father gave me the other day for a personal circumstance. And I just wanted to share it with you so you can get an idea. And also, it may be a word for you in this season. So first, in 2 Kings 6, Six, verse 8, it says, Now the king of Aram, Aram was at war against Israel. After consulting with his servants, he said, My camp will be in such and such a place. Then the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Be careful passing by this place, 
for the Armenians are going down there. So the king of Israel sent word to the place the man of God had pointed out. Time and again, Elijah warned the king so that he was on guard in such places. For this reason, the king of Aram became enraged, and he called his servants to demand of them, tell me which one of us is on the side of the king of Israel. But one of his servants replied, no one, my lord, the king, for Elijah the prophet in Israel tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Now, that is an amazing insight. And there have been times, and I'm sure that if you hold this office, that you can remember things where the Father spoke or showed you something, and you, you knew it was a warning. And you may have even had a vision of people and a situation where he was warning you, don't go there, don't open that door, uh, beware of this person, pray for them, um, and so forth. And so here, as we move on down, I'm going to switch gears to another story from 2 Kings 6. And I'm going to start in verse 24. It says, sometime later, Benadad, king of Aram, assembled his entire army and marched up to besiege Samaria. Now, Benadad, his name means son of thunder, a great shout. So there was a great famine in Samaria. Indeed, they besieged the city so long that a donkey's head sowed for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter cab of dove's dung sowed for five shekels of silver. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, Help me, my lord, the king. He answered, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? For the threshing floor or the wine press? No. Then the king answered her, What is the matter? So the famine is so great that people are eating a, a horse's head or a donkey's head. And the next story is just heartbreaking because the woman says, she says, um, this woman said to me, give up your son that we may eat him. And tomorrow we will eat my son. So we boiled my son and ate him. And the next day I said to her, give up your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Now this story reminds me a little bit about Solomon and his wisdom and the two baby, the baby that was left and the two women who were saying it was was their son, and Solomon says, bring me a sword, and I'll cut him in half, and the true mother screams out, no, let her have the child, and then he realizes she's the mother because she cares more for her child and his life, and so anyway, when this king hears that the women have boiled a, their own child and eaten its flesh, and I want you to think spiritually about that as well. When the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. And as he passed by on the wall, the people saw the sackcloth under his clothes next to his skin. And he announced, may Adonai punish me and ever so severely if the head of Elijah remains on his shoulders through this day. And so the king, just like King Ahab, who blamed Elijah, for the famine is blaming Elisha for the famine that is so horrific. A woman has bowled her child and they've eaten it. And so he's putting all that blame on the prophet and he wants the prophet's head. And that reminds me of John or Yochanan, the Baptist, the immerser, because his head was placed on a platter. And many times people do want to take off the head or the headship of the prophet, of the prophet's voice, because they blame a lot of times the prophet, and they also many times do not like to hear the truth, because the prophet will bring the truth, and sometimes the truth 
is difficult to hear. And although the truth can bring redemption and restoration, many times the people fight the words of the prophet. And so this king is saying, if, if, if Elijah, uh, if his head remains on his shoulders this day, he's like, may God punish me. And he, he is very stern. And it says in verse 32, now Elijah was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him and the king sent a messenger ahead. But before he arrived, Elijah said to the elders, do you see how this murderer has sent someone to cut off my head? So he's already seeing, he's already knowing what is transpiring. He says, look, when the messenger comes, shut the door to keep him out. Is not the sound of his master's footsteps behind him? And in several other translations, it says basically barred the door, bolt the door, press your weight against the door. Do not let this messenger in who wants to take off my head, whom the king is commanded to take off my head. And then he says, is not the sound of his master, which is the king, is not the sound of his footsteps behind him. And then verse 33, it says, While Elijah was still speaking with them, the messenger came down to him, and the king said, This calamity is from the Lord Adonai. Why should I wait for the Lord Adonai any longer? And this was the message the Father gave me the other day, where I have been dealing with uh, several attacks, several adversaries, and I know that they would like anything more than to take off my head. But the Father gave me that word, and he said, shut the door, press on the door, keep the door closed, because I am sending my king, my king Yeshua, whose voice is like thunder and lightning in his eyes. And he is going to let your adversaries know that the things that have fell upon them, that they're blaming you for, that I have allowed it to happen. And so just remember, when Joseph first has, has the dreams of his brothers bowing down before him, he doesn't, he more than likely had no understanding of that. But as he becomes second in command of all of Egypt, I'm sure that the father was bringing those dreams back to him. Your brothers are coming. There's a famine. Your, your brothers, your father, they are coming. And at the end of the matter, after his father dies and his brothers are fearful for their lives because of the things that they've done, to Joseph, he says, he says, the father allowed this. He allowed this to happen. And what you meant for evil, he's used it for the good. And he has this humility. And so the father was letting me know that although my enemies, my adversaries may want to take off my head right now, and they may blame me for the famine they're going through, that eventually <clears throat> they are going to get the understanding that he has allowed this and he is purifying and using the whole thing for his glory. And I pray this has blessed you. You can reach me at tacoamanning.com. And I pray that you all have a blessed day. Shalom.